Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd. And on this episode of the History of Hull Docks, which has been a very long time in the coming, be worth the wait because this one is quite the roller coaster of a story. It's the end of the Hull Dock Company and the beginning of something very new. This is the story of Alexandra Dock. So this is a story that requires a fair bit of background information. If you haven't already, I would strongly recommend watching the other videos in my docs playlist in order from probably the second episode onwards. In fact, even if you have, it's probably worth a rewatch simply because a lot of this information will make more sense to you with that context. So, since the first opening of Hull's very first dock in the 18th century, the docks had been built, run, administered by one company, the Hull Dock Company. And like any privately traded company, their responsibilities were largely more to their shareholders than they were to the people who actually used the docks. And this is something that hasn't really changed in 200 years, it would seem. Basically, if you've ever wondered why privatised companies tend to provide worse and worse services to you whilst at the same time recording increasing profits to their shareholders, you're pretty much already halfway there towards realising what's going on. And the problem is endemic, you see. The instant you sell shares in your company to shareholders, the incentive for shareholders to keep their shares is basically the idea that those shares will A, increase in value, and B, keep paying dividends. And if those shares don't pay dividends, if the company shows lower profits, people will sell those shares and that will drive the share price down even further. Now, the whole dock company were no exception and they operated in this very careful and cautious trying not to rock the boat for their shareholders for the better part of a hundred years despite the fact that the docks that they built were getting increasingly congested the river hull was getting congested and ships were ended up waiting out in the humber for sometimes a week before they got their turn at the dockside it's no joke when a captain wrote a letter to his employer saying it takes me less time to sail from st petersburg to the humber than it takes for me to get from the humber to the dock but even with all of this, even with all the complaints from the Trinity House, from the, the, the companies that operated on the dockside, the ship owners, even the corporation of Hull, the Hull Dock Company would sit on its hands and say, no, no, it's fine, everything's fine, we don't need any more docks, we're good, thank you. If they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. But people were going elsewhere and it was affecting Hull's prosperity. And so time and time again, the whole dock company had to be basically forced with its arm twisted up behind its back to build new docks. And this happened increasingly often towards the end of their tenure by people threatening to build a competitor of a dock. Now we saw this with Victoria Dock and we saw this again with Albert Dock, but the big one came in the 1870s. Because in the 1870s, there were some dubious things going around with Hull in terms of the monopoly of both the Hull Dock Company and another great monopoly, the North Eastern Railway. On top of a general dissatisfaction with the Hull Dock Company's unwillingness to invest and their complete monopoly over the docks in Hull, was a growing anger towards the North Eastern Railway, who were, it was claimed by many, manufacturing locomotive shortages claiming that they had no locos to pull goods out of Hull's extensive dock sidings. In fact, in 1872 this came to a head when no engines could be found for two days and dozens of trucks full of fruit, veg and fish were wasted, costing traders a lot of money. 
several other dodgy activities that the NER seemed to be doing was fixing their rates for shipping coal from the coal fields of South Yorkshire, making it just as cheap to send the coal to Middlesbrough or Hartlepool as it was to send it to the much closer Hull. Now this was an attractive proposal to the colliery owners as the docks there were cheaper and had more up-to-date coal loading machinery. It didn't hurt that the North Eastern Railway owned these docks, of course using their own super monopoly of railways and docks to put pressure on the whole dock company. In the 1870s, in the wake of this fiasco, a group of potential investors and plotters met in the Royal Station Hotel, led by a man called Colonel Gerard Smith, a banker and ex-director of the whole dock company. He claimed that most of the more conservative directors were favouring the idea of a merger with the North Eastern Railway that would mean one single massive monopoly in all access to the port, either by rail or by sea. This, they agreed, would not do. They decided that they needed not just a dock, but a railway of their own in order to circumvent both the North Eastern Railway stranglehold and the whole dock companies. The whole Barnsley and West Riding Junction Railway and Alexandra Dock Company was formed. Victorians weren't exactly great at the snappy branding, as you can probably tell. The plans were drawn up, investment was sought, and the plans were put before Parliament. Now other plans had been put before Parliament in the past. Other companies had tried to create a railway to link South Yorkshire's coal fields with the docks of Hull, and they'd all failed. The Hull and Barnsley learned from their mistakes. Rather than have a ground level railway that was going to cut across all of Hull's roads with more level crossings, which was increasingly an unpopular option in the 1870s, they were going to build a railway on an embankment that would cross all the roads on bridges. Instead of trying to drive a costly and unlikely tunnel underneath the Humber or make a bridge across it, they were going to go north and go through the Yorkshire Worlds. It was going to be on the east bank of the River Hull to take advantage of the deeper parts of the Humber's deep water channel. It would also be one of the largest locks in the country to enable basically generations of increasingly bigger ships to use the dock. Alexandra Dock was planned to be the most technologically advanced dock in Britain and certainly was going to be the most advanced dock in Hull. Victoria Dock was its only competition at the time in terms of coal and timber and it was built in the 1860s. At this point it was looking quite long in the tooth. But Hull Dock Company were not done competing with this. They weren't about to allow an upstart new company to again beat them to the punch and build their own dock here. No, no, they decided to start work on their own dock on the western side of Hull, immediately to the west of Albert Dock. And this dock would be along the same veins as Albert Dock, which had proved to be quite unpopular, long and narrow, which meant that the bigger ships struggled to actually manoeuvre in it. It would appear that Hull Dock Company's attitude towards companies saying, but we want to use bigger ships was, well, find another dock then. Use smaller ships if you want to use our docks. So it's perhaps no surprise that the Hull Dock Company, once work was underway, took one look at their new St Andrews Dock, compared it with what the Hull and Barnsley Railway were building at Alexandra Dock and kind of thought, yeah, we're not competing with that, are we? That's, that's just going to cost us a lot of money and we're not going to get any business. And at the last minute, before they installed all of the expensive coal loading machinery that they would have needed to make it a coal and timber dock, St Andrews was given over to the fishing industry and the rest, as per the last episode of this series, is of course history. Now, in terms of social history, one of the most fascinating parts of this whole stage of planning and putting things before Parliament, to me, is the PR war between the Hull and Barnsley Railway and a shadowy other company that decided it too was going to make a railway. And they would have these bizarre slanging matches in local newspapers, letter pages, under pseudonym writers. And it's fascinating to me because we often think of 
the kind of uh, manipulation of the media by fake accounts on Twitter or fake accounts on Facebook has been a distinctly modern phenomenon. And yet, here we are in the 1870s, the social media of the day being the letters page of local newspapers, we have fake accounts with names like Black Diamond and Anti Humbug, basically ridiculing each other's company's plans, their directors, and even just the whole fundamental basis of what they were trying to do. A railway on stilts, how ridiculous. These were the terms of the kind of things. And also, these companies would also hire poets to publish small mocking poems that were effectively Victorian diss tracks mocking the directors of the opposing companies. It truly was a social media war to try and stop investment from becoming a critical mass and therefore getting it up into Parliament. But despite all of this, the company managed to get its investment and put it before Parliament, and despite fierce lobbying from the North Eastern Railway and the Hull Dock Company, bills were passed to allow both the dock and the railway to be built. And it allowed the company to raise £3 million from the sale of shares, almost £300 million today. Construction began in earnest on both in 1881. The dock itself was designed by James Abernethy and was located immediately east of Victoria Dock on land reclaimed from the Humber. As you can see from this 1853 Ordnance Survey map, the Humber coastline here certainly looked very different before Alexandra and King George V docks were built. As with all the previous docks that had been built along the Humber, Alexandra Dock suffered from boils. We've explained these before in previous videos, but just to summarise, fresh water running in chalk aquifers deep under the clay bed of the Humber was disturbed by the driving of piles for the foundations of the dock. And this water, released from its rocky channel, would eat away at the clay in these foundations, causing collapses. With Alexandra Dock, one particularly dangerous boil almost collapsed the enormous lock welling up in the side walls. The original plans for the dock had been to have grand ashlar blocks facing the water, fronting the chalk aggregate that comprised the bulk of the walls. Ashlar is a cut of stone so precise that it can be even fitted together without mortar, and was thus a very expensive cut of stone, and the whole Barnsley and West Riding Junction Railway and Alexandra Dock Company were all about projecting an air of luxury, even in something as workmanlike as a dock. This never came to pass, however. There was a strike by masons which meant that the Portland cement and granite ended up being used for much of the dock walls instead. In the northeast corner of the lock, they built a pair of graving docks side by side where ships could be built and repaired, and those are still active to this day. In fact, it's not that long ago, really, I think it's only a couple of years ago, that the Arctic Corsair was resident in one of them. And the whole thing, the whole dock, the gates of the lock, the pumps that pumped water into and out of the lock and the graving docks, all of that would be powered by hydraulic power. And in fact, just behind me, you can still see the accumulator tower, which would have held a body of water vertically in order to create the power of forcing that water and creating the water pressure to drive everything. And connected to it, the boiler house, which would power the initial machinery that started the whole process. And this was unusual. This, in Hull, was the first dock to have its own isolated hydraulic power supply. St Andrews soon followed, and Albert Dock gained its own later on after some renovations happened with the Riverside Quay. But Alexandra Dock wasn't just innovative in terms of its hydraulic power system. The water that was pumped into the dock was not pumped in from the Humber, like the other docks, Victoria Dock and Albert Dock. No. This one pumped its water from Holderness Drain, which empties into the Humber just on the east side of the dock. And the idea there is that it would be much fresher water. It wouldn't be as full of the boulder clay as the River Humber and the River Hull are. And therefore, you would end up with a much better, much cleaner and much less silting up water. And when it opened in 1885, it was the most technologically advanced, the biggest, the most sophisticated dock in Britain, as predicted. That all came at quite a cost. The cost of Alexandra Dock 
in the day was 1.4 million pounds. Today, that would be 157 million. But it wasn't going to be the dock that caused problems for the whole Barnsley and West Riding Junction Railway and Alexandra Dock Company. Nor would it be that name. The railway that connected Alexandra Dock to the coal fields around Barnsley was originally planned to travel through the worlds on a route that had been surveyed to be a good, easy path. The worlds had long been a barrier to railways passing into the East Riding, with landowners charging top dollar for the sale of the flat land along the Humber to the Holland Selby Railway back in the late 1830s, and George Hudson bought acres of estate parkland to deny another flat route through to one of his rivals in the 1840s. Finding a workable route through was quite the achievement. However, it turns out that the engineers who surveyed the line initially were wrong. As work began, it became clear very quickly that this line could not be built on the planned route. This was a problem. The company had already laid the rest of the line from Hull in order to get the construction materials to the site, and to change direction now would mean returning to Parliament to go through the process of trying to get their act amended and losing a significant amount of money in the work that had already been done. The company, hereafter referred to by me using their much snappier and later name of the Hull and Barnsley Railway, decided that they would just have to go through the worlds and made new plans for three tunnels, including one that would be a mile long and a huge deep 80 foot cutting near the village of Little Wheaton. As you'll be aware if you've watched any of my railway videos, engineering works like tunnels and cuttings are not cheap. They require an army of workers, of navvies, skilled at using explosives and in working underground, and it takes a lot longer. To put it into perspective just how expensive engineering works are, the Hull and Hornsey Railway, built in the 1860s, required no engineering works at all until the owner decided to push the line all the way over the marshes to the seafront, which required a short stretch of viaduct. This tiny stretch of line, barely even noticeable on a map, almost doubled the overall cost of the railway. And the Holland Barnsley Railway had to build three tunnels and a cutting. The impact on the company's finances were devastating. They blew their three million, used up the allowed further one million in loans and had to go back before Parliament to beg for an extension to the loans whilst all work was actually stopped for nearly half of 1884 on the railway and the dock. By the time they were finished, the company had issued £6 million worth of shares, double their original allotted amount, and were in debt to the tune of three and a half million, which was three and a half times their original limit. They were in trouble. Back in Hull, savings were made by abandoning the original plan for a grand Queen Anne revival style terminus station in Kingston Square, near where Hull New Theatre is today and the spur of line that had been built towards it was instead terminated at Cannon Street, where a wooden carriage shed was hastily converted into a new terminus station. Having their main terminus station being a repurposed wooden carriage shed in one of Hull's densest industrial zones a good walk from the town centre was hardly projecting the air of luxury that the Hull and Barnsley had originally envisioned for their project but it was the only way they could save money at the time. After this flirtation with disaster, both the Hull and Barnsley Railway and Alexandra Dock opened in 1885. The dock, when it opened, was 46 acres in size, making it easily the biggest dock in Britain. And that lock was enormous, 550 feet long by 85 feet wide. It could swallow the biggest ocean going ships in the world and hopefully would continue to do so for the next few generations. The technological aspect, the fact that it had its own railway meant that there were no more mysterious locomotive shortages and rates were actually very competitive. This made it the destination for South Yorkshire's coal fields. And it was so successful in fact that whilst it was making profit it did still take a few years for it to pay off its debts but in the 1890s an extension was authorised to make it even bigger and 
in the 1900s, an extra wharf was built out into the Humber, a kind of riverside section of it, complete with warehouses. And it was on one of these warehouses that a piece of art was drawn that became kind of synonymous with Hull's docks. The dead bod is an iconic piece of imagery for Hull's port, and it was painted on the side of a warehouse on the Humber Riverside Quay. The story goes that a trawler skipper who was also an avid bird watcher had found a bird with a broken wing landed on the deck of his ship, and he spent three weeks tending to it in his cabin. When it was recovered enough, he put it in an open cardboard box on the deck and retreated with a crew member called Ponga to watch it fly off. Suddenly the bosun strode out and shouted in surprise at the bird and booted it across the deck, killing it in one blow. What the hell's that? he declared, to which Pongo replied, a dead bod. After a late night drinking session back on shore, according to the story, Pongo, who had been with the skipper watching the bird, painted the now legendary artwork on the warehouse as a joke. It proved such a popular image that despite numerous attempts to clean it off by the port authorities, it would mysteriously reappear in fresh paint soon after. For years, it was the sign to many trawlermen and sailors that they were almost home. When the wharf was demolished, the wall containing the dead bod was saved, and today it lives in the Humber Street Galleries Cafe. Colonel Gerard Smith was absolutely spot on about his predictions of the whole dock company wanting to merge with the North Eastern Railway because in 1893 they did exactly that. But the Hull and Barnsley Railway weren't slouches, they got in on that and made sure that in the Act of Parliament that enabled the amalgamation, several rules would be placed to limit the North Eastern Railway's ability to impose itself on the Hull and Barnsley, namely that yes absolutely the North Eastern Railway would be perfectly allowed to run their trains upon the Hull and Barnsley Railway as long as they weren't going to places the Hull and Barnsley couldn't already reach. And another one that was particularly good was that if the North Eastern Railway had any more plans to build any more docks in Hull, then they had to consult the Hull and Barnsley Railway first and give them the option of running it together to make a joint dock. Now, spoilers, that happened, but that's a story for the next video in this series. Alexandra Dock and the Hull and Barnsley Railway proved to be a huge success. Even after the joint dock was opened, later renamed King George V Dock next door, it was still one of Hull's two main cargo docks. Victoria Dock was, by now, a shadow of its former self. The town docks were almost unusable by any but river barges and the smallest of cargo vessels, and Albert Dock remained unpopular among ship crews thanks to its awkward entrance and narrow design. Alexandra Dock was a triumph of modern dock design, and it's telling that the joint dock followed in its large, open design ethos, and also had a huge lock. But by the 1920s, the end was in sight for the Hull and Barnsley Railway. During the First Great War, the railways had been controlled centrally by the government. And after the war, there were many people who realised that actually the increase in efficiency meant that that was a system that maybe should be made more permanent. And the idea was created of making the railways much more manageable by conglomerating all of these tiny railway companies like the Hull and Barnsley into big companies. The great groupings of the 1920s saw the Hull and Barnsley come to an end, amalgamated with its once bitter rival, the North Eastern Railway. And the North Eastern Railway then became the London and North Eastern Railway, the LNER. But the thing is that even though the NER became the LNER, it was still populated by people from the NER particularly those at the top who'd had a particularly vicious relationship with the Hull and Barnsley over the previous decades, and they loved getting their hands on their one-time rival. The Hull and Barnsley itself was decimated, passenger services were cut to ribbons, the rolling stock and the locomotives were repurposed and put onto things like the Withensee and Hornsey branch, and those that weren't were often just scrapped. Not a lot of the rolling stock remains. 
In fact, very little remains today of the old Hull and Barnsley Railway, apart from the high-level docks route which feeds King George Dock and a small strip of track that connects the Drax power station with the main line. But one thing that does still exist are a couple of coaches still being refurbished at the moment at Hull College by students. So they tried really hard to obliterate the Hull and Barnsley existence, but not quite. Thankfully, the dock itself was largely spared as it was still something of a gold mine throughout much of the early 20th century. As time ran on, however, less and less freight was coming into Hull due to the deep water channel of the Humber simply being unable to accommodate the new breed of supersized container ships and tankers. An Immingham dock opened in 1912 to compete with Hull for coal and timber freight eventually took much of Hull's bulk shipping thanks to its position enabling these giant vessels to safely reach it. As the later years of the 20th century rolled on, Alexandra Dock was no longer deemed necessary. With King George V Dock able to process almost all of Hull's shipping needs, in 1982 it was closed and the railway bridges that once crossed over Hedden Road to feed it were removed. Since then the dock has opened and closed again more often than a privy door when the flux is in town as a succession of businesses attempted to use it for their own ends. But the latest and by far the most successful has been the German firm Siemens who have turned this place into a hub for their wind turbine manufacturing industry supplying offshore wind farms with wind turbines. It's a place where they dock the enormous boats to actually transport the wind turbines and construct them and it's a huge employer for the city and that is an important thing because Hull has been hit hard by unemployment and poverty ever since the 1970s thanks to the death of the fishing industry at the hands of the Icelandic cod wars and the decline of our docks in general thanks to containerization. and so this for Hull is a success story, it's a win. Not only do we have more jobs coming here to work at Siemens, but they're really quite big on in-job education. So things like apprenticeships here have proven to be very popular. But also a 140 year old dock that was built to give two monopolies a bloody nose and succeeded in giving itself a bloody nose during its construction is still here. Rather than succumbing to the fate suffered by Victoria Dock where it was just left to rot and then filled in and turned into a housing estate or St Andrew's Dock where it was just left to rot, this is a working dock. It's still here. It's still in operation in 2023. And that really is, in my eyes, an extremely happy ending.